Uh, maybe now. Perfect. Okay. All right. So it says we're going live, and I think we're live. Maybe now. Yeah. Okay. We're all set. So, all right, guys. Hello. Uh, this is guys. Glenn Jocker. New and, uh, yeah. So welcome to our latest live session. So I'm here with Nikolai Nielsen. Uh, so Nikolai is an awesome YouTuber and ML engineer. And he's been working with Ultralytics, making a series of awesome videos to help everybody understand how to use YOLO for a number of different tasks. So, hey, Nikolai, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, how you got interested in AI, and uh, how we met each other. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, like, uh, the last couple of years here, I've been, uh, like, kind of, like, full-time on, on AI computer vision. I actually, like, uh, have a broad robotics background. Uh, so I was studying uh, robotics um, and then we kind of like went into AI computer vision that pretty much like caught my interest, like how you can use robots together with, with AI and computer vision that started to branch more into that. Wanted to like create a YouTube channel where both, both to, like uh, learn, learn more by myself, but also like teach other people, like all the cool things within AI computer vision and, uh, and robotics. So that was kind of like how I started out. And I've just been like scaling my YouTube channel, working as an AI machine learning engineer now, creating some some courses, working together with Ultralytics, a different, a bunch of different companies within AI and so on. So yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of cool stuff, but, uh, but yeah, been looking forward to, to this conversation with Glenn. Um, it's going to be, going to be awesome. <laughs> great, great. So it's, it's really interesting. You know, when I was, uh, it's funny, I don't really say this too often, but when I was younger, uh, ML wasn't really a thing. So I graduated college in 2003. And, you know, back then, like engineering was, uh, you know, actual engineering. I know there's like structural engineering and aerospace mm -hmm. engineering, things like that. But but machine learning, AI, uh, it wasn't really on people's radar. I guess it was more in like Hollywood movies. There's a bit of theory floating around. Uh, NVIDIA was like a GPU maker for video games. Okay. And ML just, I don't know, it wasn't really on people's tongues. Uh, I guess like in a general sense, the way it is these days. Like you hear so many people talking about it. And the funny thing is, that uh, like a lot of people simply get into it as a hobby, you know, like they, they don't go to school for it, but they see it and, uh, you know, Python makes everything so simple that yeah. these days it's, it's not hard just to kind of write a few lines of code, try things out. Uh, and that's how I got into YOLO and that's how I got into AI. And I think I've, uh, I've tried to contribute a bit in that same direction to make things even simpler to help people start uh, just in a few lines of code to kind of get those concepts. I guess also for myself, like I'm a, I learn by example. So I think there's a number of different ways you can kind of learn. It's maybe like listening by taking notes. Uh, but, but one of them that really works for me is just examples. And so uh, I've done, a, done my best to kind of create a lot of examples for people that they can just copy and paste, click a few buttons uh, and see how things work. So uh, I guess there's, there's two challenges in, in what I've been doing, actually three. So mm -hmm. when we started just a few years ago, you know, I was just by myself and I was working on these YOLO models on GitHub. And my main challenge was just technical. It was getting things going, getting training working, getting the performance I was looking for. Uh, and then beyond that, like once that kind of starts to fall into place, then there's this kind of communications challenge. And so in the startup space, I had this, um, had this misunderstanding that if you just make something awesome, people would just like come find you and start using it. But that's yeah. not the case at all. So if you make something really cool, uh, then after you're done doing that, you got to turn around and then let people know about it and explain like what you've done and help them use it and so on. And so that's where things like documentation, tutorials, mm -hmm. uh, and videos like really, really come into play. So I've done a little bit about that myself, but, uh, but I've always been more about the code. And so I've kind of been like notorious for just like creating features. Uh, and then instead of documenting them, just like moving on to the next feature. But the second part is just as important. Uh, and I think that's uh, like a, a great place that you've been contributing to, uh, helping people understand how everything works, not just with ultralytics YOLO models, but with a bunch of other interesting models out there too. So, for sure, for sure. yeah, so is there definitely like been, uh, been way easier to get into, into like AI machine learning and, and build things, uh, especially now with like the TVT models, like chat TVT and, and, and so on. But like I've used ultralytics a lot in, in the past. I was even like using YOLO V8 and, and those models like back in the days without even knowing like who Ultralytics was. Um, <laughs> like I've trained a bunch of YOLO V, uh, YOLO V5 models and uh, also working a lot with YOLO V8 here in, uh, in the past year, creating some, some cool videos. Like it is actually like some of my best performing videos to the YOLO V8 and also YOLO V, YOLO V5 videos back in the days. So um, 
but for sure, like a pretty awesome web, uh, like framework or like a library uh, around it, easy to use. Um, it just makes like things way more simple. You can basically like, without knowing anything about like AI, computer vision, optic detection and so on, you can basically just take like an, an, an data, a data set, like upload it into a Google Colab notebook. And then you can just like run a couple of uh, code blocks and then you actually like, have an optic detector up running. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that, that's awesome, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we've, uh, <laughs> we, let's see, we've been, we've been having meetings with like different companies and some investors and things like that that we've been trying to talk to. And, and usually I give them a walkthrough of YOLO and how it works. Uh, and like part of what I like is that it's just, it's been made so easy that even for example, with our Colab notebook, I think that's probably the easiest way to use it. And so I show them and you literally just load the notebook. Uh, you, you click the play button on the setup cell and then it downloads the Python package and installs it. And then the next cell is just the inference cell. You just click the play mm -hmm. button there and then it crunches for a few seconds and then it spits out the results. And then I tell people, I'm like, see, I'm like, everybody can do this. I'm like, now you can do this also and just tell people you're an ML engineer, <laughs> like put it on your resume. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, so this is, I think this is like a big part of the appeal because it's taking something that's complicated and just like bringing it down. So it's like when you can't reach the fruit on the tree, you're just, you know, we're like helping you lower that branch down. Um, and that's, that's super important too. I think like taking complicated things, kind of like repackaging them in a way that's actually like useful and meaningful in a simple way. Uh, that's, that's almost more of an art than a science. You know, that's, uh, that's like a big reason. Uh, I think Steve Jobs did such a great work. Uh, it was because he was taking technology, but he was, he was kind of putting it in your hands, literally in a way that was just so simple, like didn't need instruction manual. And uh, I think the intuitiveness and the adoption, I think like really picked up from there. Now, you still see it today too. I think like even though uh, Android devices probably in most cases have like higher RAM or better cameras or things like that. Like you still see like people just really like iPhones. I think it's just because of the intuitiveness and the easiness. And that's that's an example I've tried to keep in my mind when I've been doing YOLO. Because um, it's complicated, but but we don't want it to be complicated for the users. We want it to just work for them and we want them to get great results. So uh, that takes a lot of work though. <laughs> so. So that's what I do every day to stay up until like five in the morning, just like working on PRs, pull requests, features, bug fixes, things like that. It's a never ending job. Um, but I think all the feedback that we get from the community, it's, uh, you know, it's really heartwarming kind of seeing all the use cases that are out there and, and hearing everybody say all the great things that they've been creating with the YOLO models. Yeah, like I, I've seen, I've seen you put in a lot of work into like the GitHub issues and, and so on as well over the years. Um, so definitely, it's just like Leno all over like Ultralytics back in the days. Um, so yeah, Pre pretty nice to be here. Um, I think uh, yeah, we are like actually in this in, in this uh, like live session here, we're like actually going to like swap the roles. So I'm going to ask, uh, <laughs> That's right, ask yeah. uh, Glenn, Glenn a couple of questions here and there. So we will like yeah. swapping the roles. So yeah, now we're covered a bit more like about the past uh, Ultralytics history, your history, my history. Um, but what are actually like the plans going forward for Ultralytics? Now we have like YOLO V8, pretty awesome model. Like you can pretty much like do, do whatever you want within optic detection. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, there is so much work that needs to be done. So let's see, since I'm a technical guy, I usually mm -hmm. focus on the details, like the code, the modules, the classes and things like that. So within there, there's, uh, there's so much work to be done, improving the code, documenting it, refactoring it. But of course, that's not the sexy answer people like to hear. Uh, you want to hear about new architectures, uh, new tasks, sure. things like that. For sure. For sure. And, and those are equally as important also. Uh, so we've got a number of different tasks that we've recently introduced. So when I started with YOLO, uh, it was just detection. You know, you just yeah. put some boxes around things and that's worked really well. And I guess uh, I guess I got kind of lucky because that was really the sweet spot in terms of adoption and usage. And that's really what people wanted to do. And I think that's because uh, there's kind of like more interesting inference results with segmentation, with pose, but there's also a higher annotation burden. And so most people, uh, if they can get away with the detection model, they're probably going to want to use that. Or if they can get away with something even simpler, like a classification model, then that's probably the go-to solution. But okay. of course, there's, uh, there's more tasks. And so we started working on those last year. Uh, so you joined us from Weights and Biases, and uh, he was really key in kind of like pushing us to support some additional tasks. So we got segmentation going for instant segmentation last year. Also classification. We finally formalized it and we put it in. Uh, those are both part of YOLO V8. And we've also added uh, pose estimation for humans. So uh, it's okay. also expandable to other classes. So uh, the pre-trained models 
or on the Coco data set, which just has people. But we've seen a lot of interesting use cases uh, for other animals also, not just human animals. Uh, and then beyond that, we've got a few interesting things. So uh, we want to get into a few additional tasks, as we call these. So one of them is depth. I think depth is really interesting. Uh, it's a place that uh, other models like already producing results in. And I think it's kind of like one of the low-hanging fruits that we should try and tackle. And then beyond that, also, I think three-dimensional object detection has a lot of use cases in robotics. Uh, so we've been talking to some robotics companies and they are training on uh, kind of like LIDAR coupled with uh, vision. So RGBD data, as it's called, uh, red, green, blue, and depth. And I think that should be something that we should do also like later on this year. I've also heard action recognition is really popular. And so we're going to try and support that also. Uh, and lastly, this one's a bit of a Hail Mary pass. This is facial recognition. I think we might have to wait till next year to get into that though. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the, the near to medium term roadmap. And I think if we can support these additional tasks, we'll be rounding out almost 10 different tasks uh, that we support. And the really interesting part though, is if we can start to support some of these with the common backbone. Yeah. So uh, right now, when we have a new task, it's a completely separate model, which means that if you train a detection model uh, and a segmentation model, then you've trained two models. And oh, you've, okay. really, you've really kind of wasted a lot of flops because the backbones are identical between the two. So the only thing, and maybe like a lot of not people realize this, but when we train ultralytics yellow models, the backbone is exactly the same, whether it's a classification task or pose, segmentation, detection, they all use the exact same backbone. Uh, and if it's pose, segment, and detect, they use the exact same neck. The only thing that's different is the head. Oh. So the models have just a lot of commonality, like maybe like 90, 95% commonality. Uh, and if we can kind of take that next step, which would be to, to reuse all of this and to just train different heads with the same backbone, that would be really interesting. So this is, this is the kind of stuff I really love. This is like the R&D type conversations. Uh, and I think before uh, YOLO started getting popular, this is what I spent most of my time doing, was just kind of running little experiments here and there and, and learning how things worked. So now it's a lot more maintenance and it's a lot more kind of like issues and pull requests. Uh, but the repo is a whole lot more mature because of it. So. Yeah for, yeah, for sure. Like uh, that should definitely like be possible. It could be nice with like a three D object detection models directly with uh, with a couple of lines of code. Uh, for sure. Like I've 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 tried to use like like some three D object detection models and so on, but uh, some of them are still like in in the early research stages. Um, they're pretty hard to like run. You need like a lot of dependencies, and you, then you finally find some something that actually like, works, but then it runs on like Tensor. TensorFlow 1.0 or something like that, and then it's just like pain. Uh, it's, then it's just pain from there, and so on. So it would be nice with like an, uh, a three D optic detection <laughs> model with uh, with Yolo, and there's a lot of use cases with the, with it in in robotics and also just in like in real real life uh, real life scenarios. Um, so yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah, for sure. But you're right. It's uh, I guess like the the narrower the use cases get, the the harder it is, I think, to find kind of like a, like a well maintained place to to run them, to get your questions answered, things like that. So, but I think 3D yeah, object sure. detection, it's definitely, it's definitely a hot topic. I mean, especially in self-driving cars, there's, uh, there's definitely impetus to replace hardware with software, if possible. Uh, I think this is what Elon Musk calls, for example, like pseudo LIDAR. So if you could uh, train like depth models or RGBD models on LIDAR data, then they can start to understand uh, what that looks like. And then you take the LiDAR away and then you could possibly yeah. just use the model by itself. Yeah. It looks pretty good, cool what uh, what like Tesla doing, but it's a whole like another approach. Um, they're like doing a lot of research for like internal use. I saw, I actually just saw like, uh, let's just take that out. Like here in the weekend, he did like a test test drive on the new version 12 with the full self-driving. <laughs> uh, and they're back, basically like scrapped all of the code. Like they have the, he, he mentioned that they had like 300,000 lines uh, 300,000 lines of C++ C++ code uh, oh, with heuristics, that? act like combining all the models, um, giving space for pedestrians, like uh, stop signs and so on. But they have wow. completely erased all of that. It is basically like zero lines of code now. And then they just have like a complete end-to-end -end model uh, where it's taking like photons from, from the cameras directly as an input. And then it gives uh, like control outputs uh, to the vehicle. Oh, so that's wow. actually like okay. pretty cool. So, so more, now it's actually like an end-to-end -end model that they can directly train um, it's mm -hmm. just more like actually just giving it enough data 
and then training on oh. like really large uh, GPUs. So, so for sure. That's interesting. I, yeah, I've heard like a, several years ago. I mean, I've heard them say this multiple times, but it sort of seemed to be maybe like the holy grail of where they wanted to get eventually. Um, uh, I guess that's interesting because that, that should in theory be more robust than like a bunch of rules that you have to follow. Uh, for sure. Now, now they basically, means, yeah. Yeah, now, now so they basically just like need to like uh, put in more video, like if, if it's failing in some specific scenarios, like they just have to give mm -hmm. it give it more like videos example of that and they have like the large fee fleet and so on. Uh, so yeah, yeah. It was definitely like groundbreaking for them and, and probably what they're trying to like reach all the time. Yeah, I think that's their main competitive advantage is uh, yeah. is the fleet. So anytime they need new data, they can just both the data, but also the compute. It. Also the compute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, compute's uh, compute's very important. We've been getting away like over on the ultralytics side. We've been doing a lot with little compute, uh -huh. uh, but uh, yeah, I wish we had a little more. <laughs> Yeah, we were like uh, Tesla. They actually like, just started the new uh, GPU cluster yesterday. They have like that's uh, a, yeah, I just heard 10, that. Yeah, like 10k, like 300 million dollars. Uh, uh, yeah, see 10,000 each. 800. Oh my god, uh, that's pretty, that's yeah. pretty wild. While they're scaling the Doji on the sideline, yeah, that is wild. Yeah, and they're also doing their own their own hardware effort with Doji. Uh, huh. Yeah, I haven't actually, uh, I haven't run anything on an H100 myself. Uh, I've seen some benchmarks, but uh. But I'm not sure. Like, like for for us, like the price versus like the speed, it's uh, it's faster definitely than an A100. But I think for Yolo models, like the the speed increase, it's a bit of a bit of overkill, probably. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like more than wiped out by the price increase. So, <laughs> not sure. Uh, like, sure. if you had to train one model really fast, it's it's the right GPU. But if you have to like just do a lot of compute, like hyperparameter estimation, it's probably not the most efficient way. At least for Yolo, I think they might have uh, done like more optimization for transformers. And most people can probably like wait, uh, wait, wait a couple of hours or a day uh, to finish yeah. the training. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nvidia is definitely doing really well in terms of revenue, at least. Ah, for sure, for sure. Probably right. because of the like the large language model boom. Yeah, 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 yeah. But really now we're talking about like uh, yeah. the, the large language models. Uh, so Yolo mainly using convolutional networks, convolutional layers. Um, are you looking into like transformers for some for some models for optimization, segmentation, maybe even like depth? So like the most state of the art like depth models right now are actually like based on uh, transform models with the attention mechanism. Um, mm -hmm. It will be like yeah. slower, but uh, might be some advantages again. Yeah, this is interesting. So we get this question a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, we've done a lot of research with transformers. Um, so we have uh, different attention modules inside the Ultralytics repository. Uh, we've also you know, tried applying them to kind of different YOLO experiments. Uh, and we've also recently implemented real-time detection transformers, RT Detter, uh, from Baidu. So we looked at what mm -hmm. they did. Uh, we worked with that, and we got it running for both inference and training uh, within the Ultralytics package. And so we documented that, uh, and we have some models available that you can get started with. And so we learned a lot in the process of that. Uh, I think like one of the really cool things about the RT Detter models is that they don't require a non-maximal suppression layer at the end. So they just, they output boxes about threshold by themselves mm -hmm. and, and you don't need any NMS. No. And so, so Baidu kind of takes that to, uh, to, to help out with their profiling. So that means that like when they're profiling these RT data models, they don't include the NMS speed, but for the yellow models, they do, which makes sense. Uh, but what we've also seen though, is that the RT data models are a lot more finicky. So uh, they, they take about twice as long to train uh, and they generally like require more data to get to kind of like a similar level of performance. So I think for like a lot of use cases, uh, they're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. On the inference side, like they're pretty close. Um, but I think still for most edge deployment applications, I think like EOLA model is going to train faster and give you better results. But uh, I'm kind of excited about the progress that's going on. And of course, we're keeping like really close tabs on that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the more interesting things that we've done also is we've coupled a Yolo V8 model with an RT debtor head, and <laughs> this is this is like an interesting combination because in theory this should give you like a faster speed, better training stability, uh, with mm -hmm. the advantage of no NMS needed. And so those are available right now. We've got YAMLs uh, that you can get started with. We don't have pre-trained models, but you can train any size Yolo V8 model now. So you can pull up like a Yolo V8N model with an RT debtor head and start training that. So it's really interesting. So those are like available right now. Do uh, you have any benchmark in that? No, but we should. If we, if, we, if we add some more compute, we could do that. Right now we're training some classification models because 
the classification models we have right now, we only train them to 90 epochs and image net. And that was, uh -huh. we did that because we were in a hurry when we were releasing UOV8, we we're like running out of time. Uh, <laughs> but, but now that we have some more time, now we're retraining them to 300 epochs. And then once that gets done, uh, we have open images models that we're training. And then after that, like maybe we can do some benchmarks there. But this is uh, this would be like one of the nice places where if you had like a few more servers or some cloud compute, we could really be doing a few things at the same time. But uh, I guess like a lot of what I'm saying is sort of like anecdotal evidence, like just like personal experience of training them. But we should mm -hmm. we should kind of like do some training, get some tables for like the times taken, the speeds, and so on, because I think that'd be really good to compare. For sure, for sure. Is it available in the docs or? Yeah. So let's see. If you go, uh, maybe I should share my screen here. Let's see. Okay, let me try this. I'll share my screen, desktop. All right, perfect. Now, uh, let me go here. Du, du, du. All right, so our docs are just at docs.ultralytics.com. Uh, they look like this, and they're really cool. I've spent a lot of time on these. I've made about 100 <laughs> pages. And uh, let's see, so if we go here into the models category, so these are all the different models that uh, we either support or we just kind of explain a little bit. And so if we go down here, the RT debtor models uh, are here. So this is this is Baidu's RT debtor implementation. Of course, Meta came out with the original debtor, uh, I think about a year and a half ago. Mm. And that was, uh, that was definitely much slower and, and like a lot further away from being like applicable in real life than these RT debtor models. So the RT obviously stands for real time. Uh, so, uh, so let's see, so right now we've got these different ways that you can use it. So you can just do, from Ultralytics, import RT debtor. So okay. if you don't have, this package list, and then from there you can import the RT debtor class and pull up one of these pre-trained models. So this is a full full RT debtor model. Uh, it doesn't. No, I actually like tried any... that in one of my uh, in one of my videos, Jim. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what did you yeah. think of it? Um, I, they did. I think the results like looked pretty good. I didn't really get. Uh, I think it was still like pretty far away from like inference speed compared to to the Yolo model. I think, as I remember, if I remember remember correct, I probably got like around fifteen frames per second. Um, yeah, I think it really depends on the 4090. On the 4090. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it, yeah, so you're probably, if I remember correctly, I think one of the export formats is pretty slow. And I can't remember if it was Onyx or TensorRT. But that's the thing about these new models is uh, since they're kind of like a little less traveled, uh, like on different, different deployment destinations, you might get different results. So, so it works. Uh, but I think they, you know, there's like still like a little more adoption, maybe like a little more kind of community refinement that's needed to make these like really super useful. And then let's see, it looks like I don't really have any examples for how to do the YOLO ones, but if we just go to the repo and we go to the Ultralix directory. And so all the YAML files are in the CFG directory. So if we go to CFG models here, and let me make this a little bigger so people can see. Okay, so now in our V8 directory, we have uh, this YAML right here. So it's called YOLO V8 dash rt debtor dot yaml uh, and so the way these yamls work these are kind of smart yamls and you can insert a size after the eight so you can request a yolo v8 n dash rt debtor dot yaml and it'll just build that for you so mm -hmm. let me try and do let me do a live demo here live demo, yeah. that's all <laughs> yeah, so this yeah. is always exciting <laughs> all right so this is our google <laughs> collab notebook so i really love collab anytime i got a quick idea that i want to test on a gpu i'd pull this up because I work on a MacBook all the time, so I don't have any QDU devices here. But so this is going to install Trilytics, and uh, let's try like a let's just try CLI command, so we can say something like, uh, or maybe Python's better. We'll say from Trilytics import YOLO. Okay, and then we'll say model equals YOLO, and so now it's going to build this YOLO V8 RT debtor YAML. Put some colons here so there's text. All right, so it's going to run this and I'll actually create a model mm -hmm. and it doesn't create a model. So maybe maybe we have to do the RT debtor backends for these. Let's try that. Oh yeah, that's the trick. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> oh, that's right, there's no scaling. So what I was saying about the smart scaling, if you don't pass the scaling, you can see right here, I didn't say a size. So it just assumed an N size. But okay. let's say I want to create uh, an S size model. So I'm going to run this. So now it's showing all this. And now we can actually start training this. So we can say uh, model.train, we'll say data equals coco8.yaml, which is our like little toy data set. So this is gonna, it's gonna download the data set since it doesn't exist locally. And then it just starts training this, this YOLO RT debtor model. So it's, it's all working and it's really cool. What's missing is I think the benchmarks, like you were saying, 
So right now it's uh it's getting started, it's kind of doing some pre-processing. Oh, it's doing an amp check. This is this is called automatic mixed precision. Mm -hmm. So on some systems, I think kind of like some versions of Windows with some computer devices, you might get some weird results. And so we make sure that you're getting correct amp results before we start using it. And if not, then we just continue the training with amp disabled. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now it's it's training these RT debtor models. And that's interesting. We're getting a user warning. Oh, okay, yeah. So I think RT debtor models are not deterministic capable because of some of the modules inside. So that's what this warning is telling us here. So this is kind of like another one of those things that we see where there's uh, like a few kind of loose ends around these RT debtor models. Mm -hmm. But you can see training's working. Uh, we're not getting any accuracy. This is a really small data set and we're probably not gonna see any in 100 epoch. But uh, but in general, like a lot of the curves, they track pretty similar to larger YOLO models, and yeah, I think they're uh, there's something you guys can experiment with. Yeah, for sure. Also, also the inference speed or the inference speed. Yeah, the inference speed is closer than the training speed. The training speed is is about twice as slow as a YOLO model, but the inference speed is is much closer, at least mm -hmm. on CPU. Maybe on Tensor RT, like you were saying, not so much. So, so I think like a lot of the times you see kind of like benchmarks, like a lot of them sometimes get cherry picked by uh, sure. by like other companies, like trying to, cause, cause they want to appear favorable. But uh, like, I think in general, like YOLO's never really been like the very best at anything. It's just been like really, really good at a lot of different things. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've done yeah, so and well. The and the simplicity. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll uh, stop this training and yeah. Okay, so it looks like our live demo didn't actually go so terrible. <laughs> Always great, yeah. Okay, Let's see what what else we got in our question list there. Let me check. Let me check. Uh, so yeah, we, we could probably also like talk about the hub. So the Autolytics hub. Um, I played. Oh, it that's right. Bit. I tried out with like the like the hub app and so on. Uh, it was pretty cool to like run uh, run a YOLO model on uh, on my phone. Pretty nice, uh, pretty nice accuracy and and also like pretty pretty good inference speed. Uh, it has been so some time since I played with it, but. Uh, should definitely like take a look at it and create some more videos with the uh, with the hub. But can you can you like tell me uh, tell us a bit more about the hub, uh, both the, what the plans are, but also like what uh, what it is uh, at the current state. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's see. I guess this goes back a few years. So when I first started working on YOLO, uh, you know, every time I wanted to see what I'd done, I had to upload an image to my computer, run some commands, and then go find a directory and pull up the resulting image, and this made it really difficult to explain to people what in the world I was doing. So at that point in time, I was traveling around a lot and I was like in different hostels in different parts of the world. And people would ask me why I was on my computer so much. And, uh, and I try and give them like a demo. And I realized it'd be much, much easier if I had an app. And so I kind of set aside my YOLO work for a little bit and I started working on an iOS app. And <laughs> I had no idea how to build an app. And so it was a terrible process. It mm -hmm. took me like three months just to figure out what was going on. And then like three more months just to get the thing done. Uh, and then after that, I decided I'm, I'm never going to build apps again. <laughs> so I released my iOS app and, uh, and it worked actually. And, uh, and this meant that I could just like whip out my phone and people ask me what I was up to and just give them like a, an actual demo. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it worked so well that like, you know, when I started showing people, like one of the first things people asked me was like, oh, is there an Android version? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh my God. I was like, <laughs> I was like, not yet. I was like, I was like, I'm definitely, I was like, that's not me, but maybe, maybe someone else can build that. And so. So when YOLO started getting more popular and we started uh, getting partnerships that we could help monetize it with, that was the very first person that I hired was uh, uh, an Android developer. And so originally, uh, originally Hub Web didn't really exist. It was just YOLO on, on your iPhone and then mm -hmm. it was YOLO on Android. And then, uh, then once we started kind of like getting like a little bigger and I started talking to some more partners, like companies like RoboFlow and Weights and Biases, I started, uh, having more conversations with them. And I started kind of like looking a little more closely into their product. And so up until that point, I'd really been doing particle physics and I wasn't really like in the ML or the startup space that much. I was, I was just really new to it. And so I'd, I'd never heard of RoboFlow. I'd never heard of weights and biases. And so I started kind of looking at their platforms and I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is pretty useful. Like, you know, people could use these things. And then of course I thought, well, well, this makes sense. You know, maybe this would be a great way for people to also train YOLO models. Like if we had something similar. And so what I, what I thought was, okay, we can make something where people can train YOLO models if they don't know how to use Python. Uh, because 
what I've always wanted to do was really make this open for everybody. So just like, mm -hmm. like everybody can use chat GPT. So OpenAI has done an amazing job in like bringing LLMs just uh, down for everybody to use. And I think that's great. Mm -hmm. And I'd really like to do the same thing for YOLO models because right now they're, uh, they're too complicated to get started with. Uh, so we want both though. Like we do want that complication. Like you want people to be able to turn levers and like tune things and, and make them more accurate, experiment. Of course, that's like a lot of people, that's their full-time job as an ML engineer. And so we want that sort of capability. And I think, I think we have that, uh, you know, you can get your hands dirty, like as much as you want to, if you want, you can just clone the repo and even just start changing the code yourself. Mm -hmm. But on the other extreme, like we don't have that. And so like if my mom comes over and she's like, Glenn, <laughs> Glenn, how can I, you know, build a yellow model to like spot birds on my balcony or something like that, then <laughs> then I don't really have a great answer for her. You know, <laughs> like, my, like, mom, you need to learn some Python. That's, uh -huh. that's not the right answer. And so I'd, I'd like to have just like a nice platform that people would click a few buttons. So, so in that example, I just gave you like, like I feel like there should be a place where you can just go and say like, I want to spot birds and, and just like pull from public data sets, just kind of like create like a hybrid data set of like the birds you're interested in, click a button, train a model in the cloud, and then just like whip out your phone and just like set it on your balcony and it'll like ping you or something or like grab screenshots or videos like when it sees the things that you're interested in. Uh, so that that sort of like pipeline is like something you have to get uh, different tools for these days that you need a lot of expertise for. It's really complicated. And uh, and that's really like my dream for Hub is to make it something like that yeah, eventually. So right now we're just getting started with it though. So right now it's a really cool place to, and I guess I should share my screen again. Let's see here. Are you, guys right now, cool like, uh, are, are you guys like looking into large uh, foundation models like grounded uh, grounded demos uh, dino sam and, and all those different things for like you can basically like do do auto labeling um i've i played around with uh, like auto auto still yeah. it's called from uh, from overflow yeah um, yeah look, mm -hmm. looks pretty good um you can just regularly yeah. like take an arbitrary data set like a video just tell it like what to detect in uh, in the images and the video and you'll basically like get your annotations Hook it up to Autolytics, train uh, train the YOLO models, um, export it, and then uh, then you're ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think a lot of the foundation models that come out are great for annotation. Um, you know, a lot of that's been that's always kind of been the barrier to entry for mm -hmm. people is like they want to deploy something with ML, but then when we tell them they need like a thousand pictures labeled, uh -oh. they're like, oh, they're like, all right, never mind. <laughs> so I think I think like these these new models that are coming out. So if you can just pass a video and you're like, I want, I want like all these things labeled and they're like automatically segmented. These are very powerful. And I think they're going to become like more and more common in annotation pipeline. And so that's definitely going to go a long way. I think towards like automating uh, annotation pipelines and training. So, so yeah, I think for sure. Uh, like right now we're sort of focusing on the opposite side though. Like we're focusing on what do you do after you've got a data set? So we're trying to make it like really easy to train a model. Like once you got a new data set. So for example, let me see here. We're looking at our data sets and let me see. Okay, if I pull up like this drone, this is kind of a cool data set. This is, uh, this is all shot from drones in China. So I can see my labels and if they all look good, then I just click this train model button and I can select one of our Yolo V8 models or an older Yolo V5 model. Mm. But let's say I want to train on a Yolo V8N model, which is the smallest one. I just click continue and we've got different options for where you can train. Uh, Colab is super popular, just like the demo I gave. So you can actually just copy this code, paste it into Colab, it'll crunch all the, all the numbers, it'll train your model and send it back here. Or if you got your own GPUs, you can do the same, it's pretty much the same code, you just copy and paste. And we're working on like a really cool cloud training uh, that'll do it also. So once that's done, then, then your model looks like this. Uh, let me see if I can pull one up here. This is one of our CI models. So these are actually hooked into the Ultralytics repo. So it, mm -hmm. it trains hub models and then it uploads them. So, okay, let's see here. Uh, okay, this model's not trained, so let me go back. Let me take a look at this one. This one's not trained either. All right, let me look at one of our official models. All right, so here's a, here's a Yolo V8S model. So this one is trained. Uh, you can see the training curves here. You can see what the losses look like. Uh, you can also kind of drag images here to get previews. Uh, and there's, a, there's an inference API. So you can actually just like run this and you'll get inference results. And uh, you can use those however you want. You can also deploy this to a bunch of different formats. TensorFlow, Paddle Paddle, and CNN. Actually, NCNN is really interesting. This is a this is a Tencent format, and mm -hmm. it performs really well on Android devices. Not too many people know about it, but we support it out of the box, whether you use it through Hub or just with the Ultralytics Python package.
And of course, there's our app. So you scan this QR code and then you can see your train model right there on your phone. So mm-hmm. it's pretty cool. But there's a lot of cool things that are missing though. Uh, like I think uh, for sure, like I think we also want to be able to kind of monitor deployed models, like okay. whether they're in the app or the cloud so you can see what they're up to. So there's sure. kind of monitoring tools we want to build in here. Uh, I think definitely kind of hooking into different cloud providers. So a lot of companies are just tied to a single cloud and we want to be able to kind of like allow them to train on their clouds. Okay. So the hub team's doing a great job and they're rolling out more features later on this year. And then we also have integrations. So we've got RoboFlow set up and working on a number of other ones. So whether you have your data set at RoboFlow or somewhere else, you can get started real quickly from there. That looks pretty good. Like, looks pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. Mm. After, are, are you looking into like so, monetizing uh, the hub or, or what are the yeah, plans so the, from, like monetization? So you know, like Autolytics, YOLO, your framework and so on have mainly been like open source. Um, what are the plans with like monetizing some of these things or is the plans just like to keep them uh, to keep them like open source and, and free to, for everyone? Yeah, the, the plan is to do both. Uh, but monetization is like a really interesting thing. And especially for an open source company, I think it can be pretty challenging. Uh, there's no kind of one rule that fits everybody in the open source space. So this has been a big challenge of mine. I'm not uh, any kind of business genius. And so... <laughs> So we've sort of uh, been monetizing by accident, like these last couple of years. And it's sort of just been a byproduct of the popularity of YOLO. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what happened was about two years ago, I was just working on YOLO V5, but just released it and it had a lot of bugs. And I was working on making it better. And I started getting uh, some kind of attention from other startups. And so companies like Weights and Biases would come over and They'd say, hey, Glenn, we, you know, we're getting some requests from some of our users for like a YOLO v5 integration. Like, would you be happy to kind of like accept some code from us and, and pull requests and all this? And I thought, wait, some biases, what's that? And so, <laughs> so I started looking around and I looked at the platform and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I thought, yeah, this could be pretty useful. Uh, but then, then I was like, thought, well, wait a second. And I looked at their crunch base and I was like, oh, they raised a lot of money. And I think, I think at that point, they'd only raised like $20 million. Um, now they've raised a lot more. But But I was like, oh, okay, well, this is probably going to help them out. Uh, and their users are going to benefit and all this. And so I thought, okay, well, I should probably try and like strike some sort of like partnership agreement here rather than just do it for free. And so that's what I did. So uh, like I struck an agreement and they paid us a little bit of money uh, to, to get the PR done mm-hmm. and to support us and everything. And then this really helped drive the business. And so for about the first year or two, uh, like small partnerships like that is, is what we were using to monetize. Uh, but then we realized it's not very scalable. And so if you actually want like a real business, okay. then you want some sort of product that, you know, people can sign up to by the thousands, like a service or something like that. And this is, uh, this, is a, this is a big challenge. And so like at that point in time, like we were just doing YOLO and there wasn't really like a simple way to turn YOLO into something like that. So we'd been working on Hub, but, uh, but Hub was like a long way off. And at that time, like something else started happening too. So businesses started coming to us directly. And kind of like weights and biases, except uh, instead of like their users asking for it, like they, they want to use it. So they would say things like, Glenn, look, YOLO works really well. And our, our ML team like wants to use it for like this new app that we're making. But the lawyers say that we can't use any like GPL code in our product. And I'd say, oh, that sounds like a problem. What are you going to do about it? And they'd say like, oh, I think we're just going to use this other open source repository. And I was like, I was like oh no, Wait, that's not good. And so that mm-hmm. when I looked at the licensing situation, And I was, like, I was like, what can we do about this? And uh, so I did some research and it turns out that, uh, that there's like alternatives that we could offer here in this space. And so uh, what we did was that we, we created what's called a contributor license agreement. So when like new PRs came in, then the users would sign the license agreement uh, to Ultralytics and then Ultralytics could turn around and then have a uh, commercial license for the tools that we could provide the businesses. Mm-hmm. And this was pretty good because, and I liked it for two reasons. Like the first was that everybody could still use it for free. So I really want to, you know, open up the tools to everybody. Like I want the models to be like super low resources, easy to run, like almost no dependencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just kind of like make them as simple and as effective as possible. Uh, And in that way, kind of like really increase adoption. Of course, with the end goal of just like having the best positive impact that I can on the world. And So we need to run the business. And so on the other side was like the businesses. And I thought, okay, if we can monetize by selling licenses to the big businesses 
then they can kind of help fund this open source R and D that we're doing and maintain the repository and all of this. And so this, this kind of balancing act between the big enterprises and like the students and like the hobbyists using ultralytics, uh, I think has worked really well and it's, it's what we're doing now. And so now, uh, now we're focusing on licensing for kind of like commercial and enterprise applications and providing like extra support for those companies that need it. Mm. And so I think that's like, a I think it's, a more stable foundation for growing the business and kind of like reinvesting in YOLO and building for the future. So it's going really well, uh, but it's something that we've kind of had to learn the hard way, like over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And I think of course, like the only reason it's gone so well is because uh, I spent so much time in the first few years, not really worrying about, about the monetization, just, just thinking about the product and how it could make it as best as I possibly could. And then I think from that, a lot of like beneficial side effects occurred. And I think the monetization is one of them. So, no. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think it's different if you, I guess, if you set out from like day one trying to figure out like how you can make a, a really good business and a super profitable product, I think you're going to end up at a different place than, than if you start thinking like, like what's, what's a really uh, good need that people have? Like, how can I build like a super awesome tool that people love? And mm -hmm. of course, like, Doing the second isn't always going to lead to a successful business, but uh, I think it's going to lead to a product that people really like. And I think that kind of helps open the door to you uh, in the future to monetize that. It's not guaranteed, but helps your chances. Yeah, sure. And then you don't just end up uh, as another like labeling company. <laughs> There's a lot of labeling. Well, yeah. <laughs> also, there, that, no. <laughs> yeah, that, that too. Yeah. So, so yeah. So usually like when I show people hub, like hub is really interesting, but um uh, and I think it's like something that, that we should do because we want to make it easier for people to use YOLO models. Sure. But I mean, that being said, there's like, there's a lot of different solutions out there. And so like, I feel like our really unique proposition is really like the YOLO models and all the blood, sweat and tears that we put into them. And of course, they were going to keep putting into them. So, so this is a, a long-term endeavor here. Like we're not going to disappear anytime soon and we're going to keep making these models better, keep expanding them, uh, improve the documentation, the continuous actions and all that, that that help maintain them and they kind of keep them stable. So the CI actions is a place that we put like a lot of effort into. So mm -hmm. a lot of people also don't know this, but uh, almost like every few hours, uh, all of the YOLO models are they're tested, they're trained on like different data sets that we run benchmarks on them, we export them, uh, make sure everything's working correctly. So we do that on a schedule and then also like on every commit. Oh, and something something's really exciting for me, but I think nobody else cares about is I just hooked up uh, a GPU runner or a set of GPU runners to the Ultralytics repository. So now we can run our CI actions on actual CUDA backend, even mm -hmm. for multi GPU training, which is like something we've never been able to do before. So, so in the past, like every once in a while, bugs would just creep in because we weren't able to test on GPUs, but now we do. So now uh, I think we're going to get like a nice step change in stability here, like going forward. And we're going to try and keep improving it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, it would probably also be pretty, pretty nice. Like uh, I've been, uh, we're working with like YOLO models uh, for some like machine learning operations uh, projects and so on. So it would probably also be nice to have some tutorials about like how you can how we can deploy uh, YOLO models on uh, on cloud based systems like AVS, Azure, Google Cloud. Uh, yeah, and so yeah. On. Um, I know that I know that Amazon has made a tutorial on like how we can deploy YOLO. <laughs> yeah, um, Amazon's like made their own tutorials. Yeah, sometimes sometimes they reach out to us, sometimes they don't. But I saw. I saw they made one, I think, for SageMaker. Uh -huh. But you're right, there's there's so much missing, like so many guides and tutorials. Like even even the real basic ones that you would expect, like an Azure deployment tutorial. Um yeah, we really just needed some help building these things. So I guess if anybody's listening, you know, if, if you have expertise on big cloud deployments or small hardware edge deployments, uh like we need a lot of tutorials in the guides and and on video format also, like you're making Nicola. Yeah, for sure. I'll 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 try to keep contributing to uh, to the YOLO uh, <laughs> to YOLO framework as well. Yeah. YOLO is like a weird thing because it's it feels like it's like the more effort we put into it, it's like the more effort it requires. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> it's a job that's never done. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Oh, by the way, so I should say too, guys, if, if you guys are listening on, on YouTube, uh, just drop any questions you have in the comment section and we'll get to those pretty soon here, actually. Looks like we've been going for a while. 
yeah like we can i think we've covered like uh, a lot of things about like both the hub and uh update detection uh, the forward path for analytics and so on so yeah we can probably just jump to to the questions now and there will probably okay. come a bit more questions once we go over that but uh yeah yeah okay let's, let's, yeah, see, let's what, take a look and see what we, what we see here on youtube all right so uh oh we see aloha okay so high fly baller so i did all my particle physics in uh honolulu so aloha back to you let's see h4 mmr says we grew up in the ml winter and started working during the ml spring that's true yeah yeah but yeah in many ways also yeah you could call it a spring because uh even though ml has been around for so long you know the theory has been around for more than half a century uh the actual fun stuff i think we're just getting started with that so it is, does feel like the spring yeah we're, we're finally seeing some green shoots people are using it adoptions increasing and i think the future is really bright Let's see, 80% of the Python I learned was from reading from the YOLO v5 repo. It's funny. So YOLO v5 is the first time I ever used Python. Uh, so before that, it was all MATLAB. And, and when I was doing my particle physics, all the grad students, uh, they'd show me like Python work, and then I'd just show the MATLAB work, and <laughs> we could communicate with each other. <laughs> but I uh, found the light, and I've left all my MATLAB behind me in the past, thankfully. All right. Let's see. Mark Russo says it'd be nice to see some documentation on Yolo V8 converted to TF light and interpreting the TF light output. Oh, okay. So this is interesting. So it's true. There's, there's no documentation on that. So we have export docs, um, but what you describe is implemented in code in the ultralytics repository. So if you export to a TF light model and you can do that with just YOLO export format equals TF light, then you'll get a TF light model pretty easily. And then you can turn around and run inference on that, just the same way as you do with a PyTorch model. So you can say YOLO predict model equals YOLO V8N dot TF light. And it'll use that TF light model. And I think you can do that at a few different quantizations, uh, obviously for 32, probably for 16, and maybe also for in date. And if you do in date quantization, if you pass a data set, they will do a data set calibration. That's a recent PR that some users contributed just a few weeks ago. But you're right, the docs, we need, we need a lot more docs and a lot more things. Uh, let's see, Sabri Ma says, dear Glenn Jocker, how to get map from predict mode on YOLO V8? Does the map on valid mode equal as predict mode? Okay, so uh, map is a type of metric. And so metrics are always computed by comparing two different things, the truth versus the predictions. And when you run predict, you only get the prediction. There is no truth. Uh, when you run val, then you get a prediction, just like predict, but you also have a truth. And then the difference between the prediction and the truth, that's your error, and that's what the map gets predicted on. So predict will never produce metrics like map, just for the reason that uh, it's not supposed to. If you want metrics, then you have to use val node. So let's see. Azamoa Jeffrey says, what is the difference between YOLO V8, YOLO NAS, and RT debtor? Okay. I can answer this question. So these are three different models uh, created by three different groups. So YOLO V8 was created here at Ultralytics using everything we learned in YOLO V5 and everything that we also learned from the YOLO V6 and 7 efforts. YOLO NAS is started by a company in Tel Aviv called Desi.ai. And they use something called Neural Architecture Search, which is an automated way to change the model, do some trainings, and see what works. And so they have some computers that are constantly running these architecture searches, and YOLO NAS is the product of that. And then RT Detter is built upon Detter by Meta, but this is actually a Baidu model that was released in the Paddle Paddle repository. And so RT stands for real time Detter, and it's an improvement upon the original Detter models. So these are three completely different models by three different groups. Uh, YOLO. NAS and YOLO V8 are much closer than RT Detter. RT Detter is very different in that it's a transformer architecture uh -oh. uh, and it doesn't have any NMS layer. Okay, and then Mark Russo is back with another question. Let's see, okay, he says, I'm an app developer familiar with TensorFlow. It would be nice to have a collab on how we determine the TF light output. Mm, okay, yeah, I think, I think one of the things that is missing is that We've made it very easy to run TF light models back with the Ultralytics package. But of course, a lot of people don't want to use the Ultralytics package in deployment. They want to take that model and use the raw outputs for something else. And so in that sense, we're missing a lot of documentation there. 
Okay. And here we have Argo Sakian. Says, thank you very much for your great work. Don't forget to rest. <laughs> okay. This is a, I think I should write that down somewhere because I think you're right. Uh, I haven't been getting a lot of sleep lately. <laughs> That's something I need to work on. I'll, I'll put it on my to-do list and put in the roadmap. <laughs> the thing, uh... Yeah. It's a, I think it's at the end of my roadmap, but it should be at the beginning. Is that, <laughs> some people say I'm not going to last very long like this. <laughs> I need to, I need to take care of myself a little more. <laughs> I've been uh, taking care of YOLO a lot, but I've sort of been neglecting Glenn. <laughs> All right. So, it's okay, though. I mean, you have to make some sacrifices in life to, to, get, where, to get where you want to go. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Chase Dubaskis says, I usually train my models to 2,000 epochs. Okay. Well, I hope that's a pretty small data set because that's a lot of epochs. With a patient's value of 100, sometimes we get to 600 epochs. You mentioned you're training 300. Any device for choosing an epoch value for ULV8? Okay, so what you want to do is you want to train too long and then dial it back a little bit. Uh, and the way that you know that you're training too long is that your validation losses begin to increase. And this is called overfitting. If, you're, if your model never overfits, then you're likely leaving performance on the table. And the only way to guarantee that you haven't done that is to, is to see that overfitting. And then you know that, okay, okay, it's not gonna get any better. I've trained it too much. And then you kind of see where that point was. So if it starts overfitting at say 500 epochs, then you just go back to the beginning, you train a new model, but this time you train it to 500 epochs. So there's no exact way to know exactly how to train your model or the right hyperparameters to use. The, the concept here is that machine learning in general is an empirical science. Yeah, it's sort of like biology. In biology, you have to run a lot of experiments, you collect the data, and the results are the results. So in contrast to say like physics where there's theory and, uh, and you can kind of theorize things and come to conclusions that way. Like here, we don't really know the results. Like intuition only goes so far. And even people that have trained thousands of models like myself, you know, our intuition only goes so far also. So if you want a quick rule of thumb though, you can compare what's worked with other data sets. So with the Coco data set, they have about 10,000 instances per class and 1,000 images per class. And so if you can accumulate that much data, then you can expect to get similarly good performance uh, as, as they see on their data set. So again, everything is just a starting point. Uh, but I think what you're doing here seems fun. If you start with 2,000, you start uh, and it quits at 600, then you're probably training too long. You want to really align the last epoch uh, right where the overfitting starts because that'll be the minimum value for your learning rate schedulers. So and would the ultra you also yeah. get like the, the best model and also like the last model? Uh, so you get the, yeah, yeah. Both the best model and the last model. Um, yeah. So yeah, I usually just train for like a number of epochs depending on, it also depends on like your, 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 your data set. Uh, what type of images if it's like close to to the classes being in, in uh, for example like the the pre-trained models like the coco data set classes and so on or if you're training on something completely new um probably also depends oh. on your learning rate and so on um yeah. yeah i'll see your augmentation of course like if you feel like you're overfitting too early that's where you can start dialing up the augmentation uh -oh. so it makes it more difficult for the model to learn but this is part of the fun is uh, there's no right answer to this question we just have to experiment the plot. So. All right, let's see. And then we have Mike here. Are you thinking about implementing 6D pose estimation models? Wow. Okay, so, so 6D refers to six degrees of freedom. Uh, let's see, which I'm assuming is X, Y, Z. Position and roll pitch, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, uh, so this is like even beyond the depth detection that we were talking about. It, it would probably, it would probably be on the, level um, past that. on the over end side, yeah. I know yeah, a lot yeah. of research and, and so on is going into like doing 3D post estimation with like dedicated That's models. That's true, yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah. They're, they're pretty much there now, but uh, but yeah, they are pretty like dedicated models. And it has been researched a lot because it, it, it has many use cases in, in robotics and, and so on. So um, That's true. probably be pretty hard to like uh, implement or like integrate into the existing YOLO format or like existing YOLO models without doing pretty much like. I, you know, I suppose it's it's definitely something that we could do. I think to get a model like that trained, you'd probably want to fall back to simulated data because that way you could uh, have like, say like a million images at different angles and you'd know the depths and the angles of like every point in there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, 
I think it's it's definitely doable. I think uh, the question really is you just have to get the data. If it's like yeah, if it's a priority, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think I think once we get some of these other tasks like nailed out by the end of next year, then I think we'll be kind of like looking at some of these like more interesting things that we can start doing. And I think like definitely like three D pose estimation, like you said, Nikolai. I think it's it's definitely got uses, and uh, especially kind of like in robotics and video games and things like that. So. All right, and then uh, let's see. Library. Uh, so Hammer says library methods add Glenn sleep. <laughs> Glenn gets some sleep. Yeah, <laughs> I should be getting a lot of sleep, strangely, because here in Spain everybody takes a siesta, <laughs> but uh, I haven't been able to figure out how to do that. <laughs> Maybe I need some documentation on that. I think. <laughs> so I think that's it. Right? <laughs> so it looks like we got through all these questions here. Um, I think we missed uh, one from uh, from Cop Pes. He asked like, how many oh, label yeah. images do we need for a good performance train model? Um, you can take that. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, I missed the question. My goodness. Yeah, I do need to get some sleep. Okay, let's see. How many labels images do we need for good performance train model? Okay, so this is this is what I was saying about Coco is, is these kinds of questions, it's uh, there's no right answer. So it's not like if you have 99 images, everything will go wrong, but if you get 100, it'll go right. Like what happens is that the model will, will perform worse and worse, but it's a gradual degradation. Uh, I think this is called like a graceful degradation. So in general, what we do is we point people to what's worked in the past. And so the baseline data set we use here is Coco. And if you look at Coco, they've got about 100,000 images. They've got 80 classes. And if you do some math, uh, then you come out with about 10,000 instances and 1,000 images labeled per class. So an instance is just one box. That's a lot of boxes. Uh, but if you can get that much data, then you should be able to get comparable performance to what they see on the Coco data set. So 10,000 boxes, 1,000 images is kind of like an aspiration. Uh, obviously, you can start with less than that. You could start with, say, maybe 100 images in 1,000 boxes, and you'll get decent results too, or even less. You could try 10 images in 100 boxes, and that'll give you something, but uh, you probably won't like what you get. <laughs> and, then, and then the trick is to train longer, get a bigger model, uh, or collect more data. Whichever is easiest of those three. All right. Uh, looks like we just got a couple more questions. Like since I was saying that. Uh, okay. <laughs> this is this is what I was telling you, Nikolai. All right. Let's see. So Zach says I wanted to run a model with that augmentation. Oh yeah. Okay. Does Olivia use the augmentations package by default? Is there any way to turn it off without Pippa installing it? Um, I see somebody actually just submitted a pull request to disable augmentations. Then I'm not sure if that was you, but. But no, right now there's no way to disable augmentation specifically. You can disable individual augmentations by setting them to zero in your configuration YAML or just passing it at the command line. Uh, or if you just uninstall it, that'll also not use it. But uh, in general, like we are having this internal conversation that I feel like the augmentation policy in Ultralytics is a little chaotic because we've got our own augmentations like Mosaic 4, and Mosaic 9, and then we've got augmentations available, but then we've also got Torch Vision transforms. And we end up using a combination of the three often. Classification, we usually use Torch Vision, but um, for the other models, we've got kind of a combination of augmentations and Ultralytics transforms. So I think we need to work on coming up with a more formal structure there with a way to disable augmentations, like you said. And then let's see, Alex says, just a small question, how many parameters does RT Debtor have? Is it possible to use on Edge PC? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's roughly the size of the Ultralytics models. I think it might be a little bigger, but, uh, but it's not like a LLM or anything like that. It's maybe like 100, 100 million or 50 million. So you can, you can definitely use it on Edge device, but um, it's not going to be the fastest. The YOLO models will be faster on Edge and smaller probably. And then Chase says, it's been a while since I tried training YOLO on ClearML. Uh, when it did, it looks like the agent wasn't able to train, but could log. What's the state of clear on Yellow V8 right now? Okay, so uh, <laughs> that's a good question. So looks like you might have had some technical difficulties. I'd raise that with the clear ML team. Uh, the integration should be good to go. So if you get any errors, uh, definitely report them over here. But if you run into sort of like clear ML account things or agent issues, then raise them with the clear ML team. And uh, I guess the same applies to all the other integrations. So the integrations aren't actually tested in our CI, which is kind of interesting. But um, as far as I know, they should all be working correctly. And I use a, a few of them often. So. Okay, guys. All right. Uh, looks like we're at 59. Wow, it's perfect timing, Nikolai. All right. We did this just right. Right, right, right about an hour, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, well, it's been great talking to you. Uh, yeah, you know, I love watching your videos and I'm looking forward to uh, more of them coming out. Yeah, I think we have a couple of more left in, uh, in the pipeline. The next one coming out tomorrow. We're actually like, building a project Ooh. tomorrow with the uh, security system with Yolo V8. Oh, uh, that's so, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely, definitely yeah, looking forward for that to that. Video. Cool, cool. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, everybody, yeah. have a great day. Uh, I'm probably going to act on some of this advice and maybe get some sleep. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <definitely laughs> bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ciao.